want you to come on up today. I want you to come and gather in behind me our youth and youth leaders, if you will. Come ahead, guys. And first two of you up here, I want you to scoot this pulpit back for me. You guys will just set that right over there, and we'll put it right back as soon as we're done here. As soon as we're done here. All of our youth and youth leaders. Mike, would you get a, would you take a picture down here? Thank you, guys. Running from the balcony. Thank you for not jumping over. But, Jacob, would you hold this for me, please, sir? This check is for in the amount of $10,000, and we would like to ask Spencer Speed if he will come to receive this check. <laughs> On behalf of, of Crossroads Student Ministry, we would like to present to you a check in the amount of $10,000 to go to Speed the Light. Is this not a good-looking bunch here? Woo. Amen. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. You're looking at the church. Praise God. And if these guys have done this, there is nothing that the Lord is, nothing impossible for what the Lord's going to do in this group. Amen. Now, I've asked Spencer if he will. He's going to come. He's been, have you been in leadership now for three, three years? Yeah, 2017, we, we stepped in. So. He stepped in, and he's doing a fantastic job. And I am... I am honored not only to have him here, but I'm honored to call Spencer my friend. And uh, I've been so impressed with this, this man. He has just taken the, uh, the bulls by the horn. He has really just gone above and beyond. He is a man of God, a man of passion, man after God's own heart. And I want you to welcome him as he brings the word uh, today to you. Amen? Welcome him. Thank you. You guys can be seated unless y'all want to stay up here for moral support or something. So Yeah, that's good. Everybody stay up here. How y'all doing this morning? Oh, that was weak. How y'all doing this morning? I heard it's been a minute since you've been in church. Is that right? We've had to be watching online. I, I'm the same way. It's been a minute since I've gotten to preach on a stage to people in person. And uh, this is exciting. And because of that, Mike said we can go till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I am uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Pastor Mike and Andrea, for uh, letting us be here. It's an honor. My wife is actually uh, back in the back with our five-month-old son. She's in the, the little baby room there. His name is Jet. We have a five-month-old named Jet Speed. That's right. I did it. Yeah. Yeah, come on. It's great. You'll get to meet him. Uh, he'll be out here after service. I'm sure he's probably back there taking a nap. I, I tried to convince Lauren on a couple different names. I really wanted Max. I'm still maybe your second born, Max Speed, right? I said we could do all the middle names like Mock Speed and Light Speed and Top Speed. She wasn't having it. I got Jet, and that's, praise God, that was great. So uh, we're honored to be here. It's been a while since we've even been in the building. It's been maybe a year or two uh, when we did a Speed the Light rally in the gym with just all the churches in the region. And so, uh, man, we're excited to be here and just thank you for, thank you for being here. You braved the rain, the COVID, you braved the, the people, just all the people, right? You did it. You came out, and so thank you for being here. I believe that when you step out in faith, God steps out in power, and we can believe for that this morning. Amen? You can say amen a little louder than that. Yeah, that's right. I'm a holler back preacher. i like you to let me know you're awake. Otherwise, I'm going to go to sleep too, right? Uh, but no, uh, man, students, way to go. $10,000. Jacob, me and you, we sat in uh, Tyler, I think, right? Uh, at the beginning of the year, and we just we talked about with youth pastors from around the district, um, how do we have a passion for God but not for the lost? It's impossible. Just like what Andrea said, right? You, you can't have the Holy Spirit in you and not live holy. It's just what we do. If you love God, you've got to love people, all the people. John 3, 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Not a couple people in the world, not just the good ones in the world. He loved the whole world. And if we love God, then we have to love the world. You can't claim to love God and not love people. That includes the lost, the hurting, 
the rich, the poor, the pretty, the ugly. We're out there, some of us, I'm sorry. You've got to love everybody, and that's what Speed the Light is about. This check right here, this represents so much more than, than you can see right now because Speed the Light goes around the world. It's, it's domestic and foreign. It's everywhere. It is the way that students and churches and the Assemblies of God raise money to help missionaries go faster, to speak louder, to get the lost to know Jesus. It's a compassion demonstration. It, it, it provides things that otherwise missionaries around the world would not be able to get. And it's such a, a cool thing. Uh, I told Pastor Mike just a second ago, we pulled some numbers. Uh, how long have you been pastor here? Uh, seven, years. seven years. What year does that go back to? 2013? 12? Since 2012, 2013, this is, this check right here, I've got the numbers. This is, this is almost eight times the amount that, that Crossroads has raised every single year for the past eight years. And that's incredible because what this means is that there's some students and leaders in the room that care about the lost. Like 2019, $3,000, incredible, right? Uh, 2018, 1,300, 17, 1,600, 1,600, 2,400, incredible numbers. And every single number means a soul saved, right? And that's what we celebrate. It doesn't matter the number, we celebrate it, but when it gets bigger and bigger, guess what that means? More people. And some people are like, well, it's not about the numbers. Can I tell you, up in heaven it is. We want to see all the people in heaven. And that's what's going to make the angels rejoice. It says they rejoice when one person. Can you imagine when hundreds and thousands of people come to know Jesus? They'd be a lot louder than that little bitty amen you just gave me. Woo! I'll, I'll tell you, they would be screaming, shouting, jumping. Amen! Hallelujah! They would lose it. Because it means eternity in heaven, with our maker, with the one who created us, our champion that we just sang about, that everybody deserves to know who that is. And so Speed the Light is a way that we do that. Uh, Speed the Light provides essential transportation. So imagine just for a second, God speaks to you. For some of us, that's like, whoa, that's a big deal. He wants to speak to you. Exciting news. God wants to speak to you. He wants to talk to you. He wants a relationship with you. Imagine he speaks to you and says, um, I just want you to do something for me. I want you to pack up you and all of your family and move to Africa. <clears throat> Say what? <laughs> You're like, that was some bad Taco Bell last night, right? You got something moving. No, can you just imagine God called you to do something crazy like that, to take your entire family to a place you don't know, people you don't know, a language you don't know, to do one thing, tell people about him. That's what we have missionaries all around the world doing right now. And when they get there, they're not allowed to find a job. They're not allowed to, to buy things like we can buy stuff in America. And so what happens is they have to rely on whatever transportation they have there unless students like Crossroads students here raise money to buy vehicles. We've got right now missionaries who we've bought vehicles in every kind of thing imaginable, right? Because some places a car would not be good. Like in India, we bought our missionaries some dirt bikes, because they can get up and in the mountains. In, uh, in another place over in the Far East, we bought a, a set of donkeys for Speed the Light. Because not even dirt bikes would do the job. So the missionaries could get on the donkeys and get through all of these cracks and crevices of the rocks to get to where these unreached people are. Because God cares about every one of them. In Russia, because it gets so bad, we've bought snowmobiles in the past. Like, this stuff is cool. And then, obviously, you've got every other kind of vehicle. You've got your trucks and your cars and that kind of stuff. Because when people are trusting in God to provide, he's going to do it. Right? He's going to do it. And he gets to do the coolest thing. He gets to use us. How, how awesome is that? We get to be used by God, the one that made us. And he cares so much that you would be obedient to him. So Speed the Light, it, it works with transportation. It works with equipment, like the stuff that you see up here, microphones and projectors, because once again, our missionaries go around the world. They want to be able to project things like we do. They want to be able to sing loud, to preach loud. So we've bought microphones and sound systems and all kinds of stuff. That's what Speed the Light does. And the last one is compassion projects. Uh, has anybody heard of Convoy of Hope? You've probably seen uh, their trucks. Right now, they're actually in South Texas and Louisiana because of Hurricane Laura, and they're providing uh, compassion efforts food and shelter and clothes and all kinds of stuff to reach out to people that are lost and hurting. Because sometimes people need not just a word from the Lord, but a deed from the Lord, right? Man, they need somebody to step out and love. One of the greatest messages you could ever preach is the way you live. Let me say it again, because some of you just hit here and then fell down. The greatest message you could ever preach is the way that you live. Showing the love of Jesus, showing the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the patience that Jesus has given you 
For you to act that out, that's what people see and go, ooh, there's something different about you that I want. And now there's a way for, for Christ to come in and make a difference. So Convoy of Hope, another one that we're working on right now uh, is with an organization called World Serve. Uh, I actually got to, me and Lauren got to go to Kenya, Africa this past year where we are partnering with Assemblies of God churches and pastors to put water wells in right next to their churches because right now there are women and children that will walk seven hours every day one way to find clean water for their family, pack it up on their shoulders, and walk seven hours back the other way. Fourteen hours a day of walking to get their family clean, clean water in some situations. So we're working with an organization through Speed the Light to put a water well next to a church so that they, can't, they can have physical water, but also they can get some spiritual water, right? And in these cities that we've seen, we went to a place where there's going to be a water well, and there's a church, and there was nobody. We didn't see houses for miles. And then we went to one where they had just dug a water well. Can I tell you how it flourished? Because if you think in Africa, everything out there relies on water. Their farm animals, their food, their drinking water, every single thing that they need, their crops. If they're going to live, they need water. That'll preach. I'm not going to go there, but that'll preach. If you want to live, you need the water, right? Somebody, come on. Walk to the well. Here we go. I'm just kidding. But this is what Speed the Light does. It gives opportunities for God to be known. That should get you excited. Amen. That should get you to be like these students that say, hey, even in a pandemic, I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to find ways to raise money because it's not about me. And that's where some... That's where sometimes this world, I won't say individual people, this world has a problem. We are a selfish world because we want what we can have for us, and that's all that matters. And when we get saved, that's all that matters. I'll come to church, and I'll sit in my spot, and I, I'm going to go to heaven. And all around us, we have people that are dying and going to hell because we won't step out of our comfort zone to let somebody know that Jesus loves them. Mm. I love the passage that uh, Andrea just talked about in Isaiah that the, the Lord has given them. And as worship was going on, I, I was recollected to Jeremiah chapter one. Um, God is speaking to Jeremiah and he says this. He says, hey, I, I'm calling you to do something. Jer Jeremiah goes, oh, but I'm just young. I can't speak. And God goes, I don't want your giftedness. I want your willingness. God doesn't need your giftedness. I don't care how good you are, whatever you are. God's saying, that, that's great. And I gave you those things. But what I really want you to do is trust me whenever I speak to you. He's wanting your willingness to step out and make his name known because your name doesn't matter. Your bank account doesn't matter. Where you live, what you drive, none of it matters. The only thing that matters is that he is made famous, that every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord. And until that day, none of us matters. None of it. And so God has given us this opportunity. Jeremiah, my favorite passage, man, Jeremiah 1.10. That's what he says. He says, uh, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too young to do anything. And this is what God said. I've given you the words to speak in your mouth. And here's my favorite. Uh, Pastor Mike asked me, he said, hey, tell, tell me your heart for the young people. This is it right here. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. Not just cities. Today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. Here we go, to uproot and to tear down. How many of you know there's things in this world that need to be uprooted and torn down? God has given us the power to do that. Nations and kingdoms, to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, and my favorite, to build and to plant. That it's not just breaking everything down. Oh, we just got to get rid of it all. No, it's got to be planted like that oak tree. We've got to have that seed of righteousness, of holiness that gets planted and that it begins to flourish and that people begin to find shade and fruit from it. That it creates something that God can use. He wants to use you in every single aspect, moment, second of your life. I've been doing this, uh, this devotional and, and the first three chapters of it has been to me somewhat uh, rudimentary, like the elementary stage. I'm like, I, I know it's a deep book. Blackaby is the author and, and Blackaby is like a deep theological guy. Like you read that and you're kind of like confused. You're like, do I believe the Bible? Do I know what it says? I don't know. He's deep and I begin to read it in the first three chapters. This is a lot in a book, right? First three chapters talks about one thing, my relationship with him. It doesn't talk about how I can do all the right things. How many times did you go to church? How many times did you pray? How many times did you read your Bible? How many times, right? Like it's not this checklist. It's about one thing, being with God. You're not called a human doing. 
You're called a human being. God created you to be with him in relationship. He wants to know you. The, the original uh, word of that is yada, to know. It's like a, a marital no. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of you don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> yada, to know, to have an intimate covenantal relationship with somebody. This is what the God, the creator of heaven and earth, wants with each and every one of us. A second ago, I said he wants to speak to you. Some of you are like, I've never heard God speak. Maybe you just weren't listening. You didn't like what you heard. God wants to speak to you, and he's speaking every single day if you would listen. Some of us, we've got too much noise, and we need to shut that off. God's going, I want to use you each and every day. I want you to, to flourish. Why? Because there's 3.1 billion people in the world that don't know me. If that doesn't break your heart, it's not working. 3.1 billion people on the globe that do not know Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, until every knee bows and every tongue confesses. That means we, as followers of Christ, got a lot of work to do, right? And so we can't just sit and twiddle our thumbs and watch our favorite uh, Netflix series and just hang out. And, well, there's a, there's a COVID outside, so I'm going to sit back. No, listen, there's people dying outside. There's people hurting. We're called to go to them. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go and make disciples. Don't sit. Don't wait. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them what I've taught you, right? This is what God has called us to do. And so many of us are okay with just going to church. I went and I'm good. Church opened, I came, now I'll go do my, the rest of my week. God says, no, 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 I'm, I'm the rest of your week. You're walking with me every single day. You're supposed to be walking with me so I can show you the people that need me and so you can grow closer to me because we're called to be with Christ. And so my heart for, for the young people, my heart for this generation is that they would do this, that they would learn to be with God, that they would learn that there's no greater relationship than that with God, that there's no greater investment than spending time with God. Some of us would say, well, uh, you know, I've got to go serve other people. I've got to do these things. Can I tell you the greatest investment you can make for somebody else is make sure you're okay first. It's not selfish. That's the right thing to do, to make sure you are in line with God. God, I need you. God, sanctify me. Make me holy. Help me to continue to walk in your peace, in your goodness, in your righteousness. This is what we're called to do. And so, so one of the biggest things that, that I worry about for the next generation, there's a statistic out there that says that two-thirds of all high school graduates will walk away from their faith over those next four years of college. Two-thirds of students that were in church would walk away from their faith. So I believe that God is raising up a generation that's ready to fight. That they're not okay with the previous statistics. They're not okay with their friends walking away. They're not okay with all the injustice in the world. And that they would stand up for what they know is right. That they would live fearlessly. Fearlessly. There's a, a passage in Mark uh, about a blind man named Bartimaeus. Anybody ever heard of blind Bartimaeus? It's easy to remember because it's just kind of an interesting name. I'm sorry if your name is Bartimaeus in the room. It's, it's a weird name. I'll say it. Bartimaeus. Uh, Bartimaeus is hanging out in, uh, in the, in the uh, book of Mark, and he's blind, probably a beggar. He's wearing a beggar's coat, they say, and he's hanging out in a big crowd. He hears that Jesus is coming. Now, in the book of Mark, we've, we've seen multiple miracles at this point. We've seen him raise the dead to life. Hello, right? Blind eyes open. He, we've seen all these kind of miracles. Blind Bartimaeus hears, everybody say hears, hears that Jesus is coming. There's some stuff that when we hear, we respond, right? Ice cream truck, come on, somebody. You start running outside. -na 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 -na. Ah! You thought there was a marathon going on or something crazy, right? Uh, you, a fire alarm, you hear it start going off. It's the loudest, most insane noise. Beep, beep, right, like that's the noise. You know, I'm going to respond to that. I'm going to get my booty out the church right now because there's a fire in the place. If you, if you go to school, you hear the school bell, school bell, we respond to that and go, I'm getting out of this class, I'm going to go to the next one. There's a lot of things that we respond to. Blind Bartimaeus, he hears that Jesus is coming and he responds. And I think it's interesting because we could probably evaluate our own lives and go, how do we respond when we hear Jesus? Oh, that's a good word. Somebody else needs to hear that. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Or, oh, that's, yeah, that, yeah, that's good for later, but I'm busy right now. Right? Blind Bartimaeus, he hears that Jesus is coming. He says there's a crowd following him, basically like a parade. It's loud. Blind Bartimaeus stops what he's doing and goes, Jesus! I talked about a fearless generation, right? Most people are scared to go, Jesus, I love you. 
Bartimaeus goes, Jesus! And the crowd around him goes, shh, hush, 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 he's busy. You know what he does? Jesus! He yells all the louder. Why? Because he knows what he needs. We've got a young generation that's being raised up right now that knows that they need something greater and they want to be a part of it. And Jesus says, blind Bartimaeus, what do you need? And he says, all right, here's your, here it is. Boom, throw off your, your, your coat and be healed. I believe we've got a fearless group of young people being raised up right now. But I'm worried about the people that are helping raise them because sometimes they're doing it alone. Is that right? When's the last time we've, we've been a mentor to a young person? Because a lot of times, young people, they, they get the short end of the stick. They get yelled at. They get, man, all they do is on their phone. It's all me, 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 and I phone this, and I this, and oh, right? But how many times have we sat down with them and said, hey, let me walk you through what this looks like? Hey, let's talk about what's going on in your life. Let me just say this. If, if you're a, an older person in the room, you've got a responsibility for the younger generation. You find somebody and you say, hey, how are you doing? How can I help you? What can I walk you through? This is what our generation needs is a mentor, not just somebody to manage them, right? Because this generation, the generation coming up right now, they want to be a part of something more than any other generation. They're more formally educated, right? They've got information at their fingertips like none of us have ever seen in our life, which is scary because that means they can find out if you're telling the truth or not real quick. Woo! Right? Because young people in the room, somebody says something you're unsure about, what do you do? Let me pull up my phone and Google that. Nope, wrong. Kanye said it was something else. Right? Like they have all this information, but they need people to walk them through what that looks like. We've got to give them experiences. We've got to walk them through what a relationship with God looks like. It's our responsibility, right? We've got to give them experiences. We've got to let them participate. We've got to bring them along, right, hand in hand, and walk them through this. Check this out. One of my favorite things, we did summer camp this summer. Even in the midst of crazy COVID, we made sure we were real safe. We had almost 2,000 kids show up. And can I tell you, the Spirit of God moved like I haven't seen in over 10 years at those camps. Because there were people that stepped out in faith and said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. Can I tell you, students experienced God like I hadn't seen them experience God in years. And we got to walk them through that and, and explain to them what this looks like. Because no longer is this generation going to be okay with moms, dads, grandmas, religion. They want their own. They want their own. And they want to know what they believe. They want to walk in faith knowing that they know what the Bible says. That they know who God is. This is what a young generation wants. And it requires us to step out a little bit. They're also uh, the, the most technological generation that has ever been. Now, if you're, if you're over, let's pick a, a number. If you're over 40, let's say 40. That's a safe number, right? That's not old. Okay? It's not old. 40. If you're over 40, there is stuff that most people under 40 know a lot better than you. I helped my father-in-law this morning uh, move a TV and unplug some stuff, and he's looking at some wires. And he's going, what is who, who, what are you, what are you? And I was like, oh, it's this, this, and this. And he's like, ah, right? And he's not old, but there's a lot more things that I've learned about technology. Young people want, want us older folk to realize and recognize that they've got information, that they've got knowledge, that you're not just a young person. Let me kick you to the side, because what do we read about in Jeremiah? No, you're not too young. I've appointed you over nations and kingdoms. Not just the old people. I've, I've called the young people to speak. So they want us to recognize that. I, I broke it down just a little bit for our generations. Uh, and this is kind of by technology, right? So all the generations, are there, you've heard of Gen Z, Gen X, all these different things. Here we go. I'm going to go all the way down. The GI generation, 1901 to 1926. The way they communicated, Pony Express. That's good, right? What about the tra traditionalist or the silent generation is what they called it. 1927 and 1945, communication style, telegram. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you remember these either. Uh, baby boomers, 46 to 64, two-way radio, pretty popular. Uh, generation X, born in 65 to 76, somewhere around there. The telephone was a big deal. I'm waiting for some nods. Yep, I see him. I see that nod. I see that nod. Uh, millennials, uh, they were born around 77 to 95. Some people will push it even further. Uh, they're the cell phone generation. No longer are you tied to the wall, right? And how long is that cord? That's where you could take the phone. It's like, I've got a phone with me. Woo, praise the Lord. I can talk to people. And then now we've got Gen Z. Some of them call them the iGen because they 
The way they communicate is the iPhone. That's a normal thing. They didn't know time before the iPhone, right? But because of that, they've got so much more information, and they want us old people to realize, hey, I've got value. I matter, right? I matter. And I love that that generation is willing to fight for it. They're willing to fight. Luke chapter 5 talks about um, some friends that have a, a... I'm assuming it's a friend. I don't know. Pastor Mike, you're way more theologically advanced than me. You could tell me. Uh, they carry him on a mat and take him through a roof. I, I, it doesn't say that it's their friend necessarily. But here's what I love about this generation is, is they identify with this story. Anybody heard the story of, of the, the uh, lame man being lowered through the roof to see Jesus? Some of you have seen that? If you were ever in Sunday school, we had the little panel. The, the, what are those called? Yeah, those ones. We had those things and we lower them through, right? This is what I love about this generation is they, they remind me of these young guys. It doesn't say that they were friends, but they saw a guy that could not walk and heard that Jesus, who's been healing everybody, is coming to town. So what do they do? Anything they have to to get him to experience Jesus. Most of us on any given day would say, well, the house is full, so we'll try next week. So in the story, if, if you don't know it, they take the lame man who's on a, a, a plank, a mat, a, a hard surface, piece of plywood for, for you that, that are handy, and they carry him all the way to this house where Jesus is supposed to be at. There's no room in the doors or the windows. They can't get him in at all. So what? I, I just love this guy. Hey, how about the roof? Right? Like everybody's got that friend that's like, what did you just say? <laughs> you want to go through the roof? Come again? Right? And everybody, and so you got that friend. But then these other three guys that are helping out, they're like, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> these guys would have been a lot of fun to have around. I'm just saying. So they get him up on the roof, which would have been funny. Who's got the bottom? Who's pulling him up? How did they tie him to it? And then, I don't know. I just, it would be picture perfect. Best movie ever. Like comedy, central, awesome. They get him to the roof. They cut a hole in somebody else's roof. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I'm going to come over to your house. I'm going to cut a hole in your roof so I can get my maybe friend, not friend. This is just lame man. And I'm going to lower him down so that he can see Jesus. What does that mean? They're willing to do anything necessary for those that need help. This is a generation that cares about the lost. They care about every single person and they're willing to fight for them. Why? Because they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah? I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. That's why nationwide, somebody, I'll, I'll say some stuff that, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Kickstarters before. It's where somebody has an idea, and you can pay. You can kind of like, oh, I'll give $20 to that. I'll give $20 to this. And their idea can come to life, and they can try to make something. Why? Because, oh, I want to be a part of that. That's pretty cool. Uh, there's these other things uh, called GoFundMe, where somebody is in need of something. It could be like, oh, one of my friends got an accident. They have medical bills. We want to help. Or like one of my friends is going around the world. I want to help pay to, for them to go climb mountains. They've created something called GoFundMe, where you can pay for somebody else so that they can do something. Isn't that strange? It is strange, right? But why? It's because there's a generation that cares more about themselves. They want to see other people succeed. The, the most wanted Christmas item last year uh, was a YouTube subscription, YouTube channel nationwide. Why? Because they want to create. They want to be a part of something bigger. This is a generation that sees beyond themselves. And can I tell you, when we unleash an educated generation for the cause of Christ, there is nothing that can stop them. But we've also got to help and we've got to get out of the way. Because some of us older people, we will hold them back. No, 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 that's not how we did it in my time. That ain't going to work. Who's, who said that before? You? Yeah, right? We've all done. No, that's, that's, that's not a good idea. That's bad, right? We, we've all done something like that. We've held people back from the God-given dreams and potential that he's placed in their life. Because sometimes our imagination is not big enough. Here's what I know. Jesus came and lived on earth 30 plus years. He pulled 12 people around him to do life with. Most of them were teenagers. Most of them were, were young adults. That he, this, is, this is what Jesus did. He came around some people and said, you know what? I need some people that are willing to change the world. I need some people that will look at opposition and go, oh, that's just a challenge. Right? 
that I'll do anything to get past that. I will step out and do whatever it takes. Why? For the cause of Christ. He called the disciples in crazy ways, right? Simon Peter, he's, he's out fishing one night. Man, Simon Peter, he's a stud. I think he's a little bit older, but it's all good. He's still young. Simon Peter fishing all night and caught zero. Anybody ever done that? Who likes to fish in the room? You have a lure shirt on. I saw you. I don't know if you fish or not, but your shirt says lure. Fishing people. It is no fun to go fish and not catch any fish, right? You catch a sunburn. You can catch the wind. You can catch a lot of stuff, right? But when you go fish and you don't catch any fish, it's less fun. Some of you, you could sit out there and you're just happy to be out there. That's good. It's not really fun. I'll be honest. You want to catch the fish. Simon Peter goes out. This is his job to catch fish. Can you imagine your job going and working and being completely unsuccessful one day? Uh, excuse me, boss. Uh, I did nothing today, so I continue to like my salary, please. Uh, hold up. That doesn't work, right? Simon Peter all night long fished, working the graveyard shift. Him and his men, he'd come back, and they start cleaning the nets, which is not a quick process pulling these giant nets out, making sure all of the little seams are good, all the connection points, getting it dry, all this kind of stuff. And Jesus approaches. There's a crowd wanting to learn from Jesus. And, and Jesus looks at Simon and goes, hey, I'm going to hop up in your boat. I'm going to start preaching. <laughs> Simon's like, uh, okay. He just needed a pulpit. Jesus needed a pulpit. And Simon says, all right, do that. And so they push out a little bit from the water. First off, Simon was, was probably tired, right? Again, caught no fish, probably a little irritable. <laughs> How many of you been that person? Like completely unsuccessful at something, so when somebody talks to you, you're like, no, I don't want it, no. And you're like, oh, I just said hi. How are you doing? <laughs> right? Simon trusts this Jesus that he's heard about. Yeah, yeah, hop in my boat. That's fine. I can let you use my boat. That's not too much to ask, right? And so Jesus began to preach. He begins to go, and, and then he says this to Peter. I love it. He says, hey, why don't we, he gets done preaching, why don't we push out a little further and let's go fishing? <laughs> How many of you had that, that one person that asked you something after you've tried time and time again and failed time and time again, and you were just like, <laughs> oh, you want to go fishing, huh? Yeah, I'll take you fishing. <laughs> and you're like thinking, I'm going to kill them and then throw them over the boat, whatever it is, right? This is, I could imagine this was Simon's uh, thinking, like, you don't understand, sir. I just fished all night. There's no more fish. Not a fish in the water. Not a but here's what I love about what happens when you let Jesus in your boat. First off, he changes your plans, right? Peter's probably tired. He stinks. He's cleaned his nets. He's ready to go home. Jesus stepped in and goes, hey, I want to change your plans, right? Second thing, he says, hey, let's throw out the nets into deep water. Oh, God, I can't believe he wants to throw the nets in. Okay, sir, yeah, let's throw out the nets in deep water, right? And so what does he do? He, he says, all right, if you say it, Jesus, then I'll do it. What I like in the original text is in this part, he calls him teacher, is the word that he actually uses in the, in the uh, original text. Jesus, you're a teacher. I've heard all about you. You're a teacher. Okay, teacher, let's go throw out the nets and find out what happens. And do you know the rest of the story? They throw out the nets into deep water, and it says they catch such a catch that it begins to sink their boat. Hello. That's a lot of fish. So what do they have to do? They have to call their friends. Hey, come over here. Hook this net to your boat, and you need, you need to need you over there, and we're going to pull all these things in, right? So it changed his plan. It changed his perspective. Whoa, okay. When this dude's a part of it, something's happening, right? They get, to, they get back to shore, and Simon Peter says, Lord, I, I'm not worthy. Can I tell you that's a, a, a translation difference? He said teacher the first time, and he says savior the second. When God gets in your midst, changes your plan, it changes your perspective. You begin to see things differently. No longer is getting on the boat after not catching anything crazy, it's obedient. All right, yeah, I'll do that. Can I tell you, God's looking for some people that will be obedient today. Even if it sounds crazy. Even if it sounds crazy. Some of you, you... You called it quits it crazy. Nope. I was good with praying in my closet. I was good with reading my Bible every once in a while, but, but you want me to talk to who? Uh, I'm not a preacher. Some of you say, I I've got limits. I've, I've got this little bubble, and this is me and my Jesus bubble, and anything past that is off limits. Jesus is saying, hey, if you can step out of that, I'll show you a perspective 
And the last thing he does is he gives them a purpose. He says, hey, no longer are you going to fish for fish. You're going to fish for people. You're going to be a fisher of men. This is where when we let God in, he changes our purpose in our life. And some of us, we've let God in and we've gotten to the point where he changed our perspective. Man, there's sin in the world and I hate it and I love God and I'm going to go to heaven. But some of us, we haven't let him get to our purpose. God wants to change your purpose. I don't mean he wants to change your job, your title, your whatever, even though it could be that. For some of us, it's our mentality. Our purpose is no longer I go to work and I get a paycheck and I go eat and then I go to sleep and I do the same thing over and over again. It's I wake up and I look around me when I get gas to go, ooh, who has God put in my path? Who, who do I need? And then I get back in the car and I get to work and as soon as I open the door, oh, there's the receptionist that looks like she's having a bad day. Uh, maybe God's give me something to say. God, do you want me to say something to this? Okay, the Spirit just used me. Hey, I, I just want to tell you that, that uh, Jesus loves you. <laughs> that was scary. <laughs> the Bible, true love casts out all fear so that wouldn't have been scary because God is in me and he is love and when I love him then nothing's crazy I don't have to have anxiety because he knows the way <sighs> when our purpose is changed God can make himself known when our purpose is changed God can use even a wretch like me if somebody wants to come up and just play I I just want to say this today, and I'm about done. I know it's, it's uh, yeah, it's close to lunchtime. I can feel it. God has such incredible plans for you. This is not in notes. Let me just tell you, this is what I feel like God is speaking to you. God has such incredible plans for you, but sometimes you see his plans is minimal. But that's so little. If I just tell him Jesus loves him, that's, that's not really anything. It's obedience. Because I've had conversations with people before that said, oh, I was about to commit suicide that night, but then you said what God told you to say. Is that because I'm good? No, it's because I was sensitive to the Holy Spirit moving inside of me. That God has a purpose for your life that surpasses your purpose. Let me break that down because that's, that's a little bit big. God has a purpose for your life that's bigger than just for your life. Your sacrifice is for someone else's story. When you do something great, it affects someone else. This is what Speed the Light is all about. Man, when you do something, when you give something, when you sacrifice something, God can show up. He wants to use every part of you. He wants to use your time. He wants to use your finances. He wants to use your talents. You're good at that? Guess what? God gave you it. He wants to use it for his good. Can I say, it's not just for you. God's using you for someone else's good. And I think the greatest challenge I could give you today is would you look for his purpose in your life? Every single moment. Would you wake up tomorrow and go, all right, God, I'm on mission. God, I'm focused in on you. God, have your way in my life. Isaiah that we read, Jeremiah that we read, well, I don't have the words. Guess what? You don't need them. God's got them for you. Okay. Got a little more confidence. I don't need to know it. Okay. And then everywhere you go, would you go, all right, God, who is it? What is it? How can I be used by you? Can you lead me? Can you guide me? Some of us, the greatest thing that's going to happen is your attitude's going to change. And some of you need an attitude change. Right? Woe is me. That's how we walk around. Can I tell you, your expectation affects your experience. I'm going to walk every day going, God, I expect you to do something great. Why? Because you are the I am. You said that you can do all things, right? Not that I can do them, but when I walk in you, when I walk with the power of the Holy Spirit, something else changes. Something happens. But we've been trying to walk in our own power. What can I do for someone else? Nothing. Sorry, it hurts. I know. You can't do anything for anybody, but God, through you, can do everything for somebody. Would you be obedient this week? I said tomorrow morning, but what about when we walk out of this building? Where are you going to lunch? Who are you going to talk to? Who are you going to look for? Who are you going to open your eyes to, right? The problem with lots of Christians is we have blinders on that go, I'm going to do what I'm doing because I've got God and that's all I need. And uh, 
And God's saying, no, 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 you're supposed to see like this. I've got everything I need to reach everybody out here. God wants to use you. Don't be scared. He's equipped you. He's called you. You are more than enough. Why? Because he's with you. He's fighting for you. He's our champion, right? What would your life look like if every second you go, all right, God, what's next? All right, God, lead me. Holy Spirit, use me. Not my might, not my will, but the power of the Lord, right? God, use me. I need you. I need you. God, who is it? Who, who in this room needs you? What can I say to them? Can I tell you, I feel like the church as of late has missed out on the power of the Spirit because we've tried to do it our own way. We've relied on what we can do. We've relied on agendas. We've relied on what has been in the past, right? Well, I experienced God in worship one time like this, so I want that again. No, I want more than that again. Quit looking for the same thing and look for the more that God wants to reveal. He says in our relationship that he wants to continue to reveal the mystery of who he is to us. What does that look like for you every day when you have that time with God? Every day when you wake up and go, God, help me to be closer to you. Help me to have a relationship with you. Help me to grow in who you've called me to be. Here's what I want to do. I want to ask everybody, if you just close your eyes and bow your heads, I want to give the opportunity. If there is someone in this room that you'd say, I... Pastor Spencer, this all sounds great, but I don't know this Jesus that came and healed the blind and, and gave the lame his legs again and who caught all these fish. I don't know this Jesus. It's the Jesus that God sent. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that you may have eternal life. And it says in the Bible that all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and your sins are forgiven. You will be saved. You turn from your ways and you begin to walk in his purpose. And if there's anybody in this room, I, want, I never want to miss this opportunity for you to start a relationship with him. That's what we talked about this morning. He wants to know you personally. He wants to give you purpose. And if you'd say, I don't know him. I've never asked him in my life. I've got sin that I need to be gone. He's the one that can take it. So if that's you and today you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, you want to give him your life, and you want to live on purpose, I want you to raise your hand right now. I want to pray with you. If there's anybody in the room, One more second. Praise God. I believe that means everybody in this room is saved. If you know Jesus. So here's the second prayer I want to pray over. You can keep your head bowed. I want to pray that you would trust in God. That you would cast out the fear that would cripple you from doing the purpose that God has called you to. That you would be willing to sacrifice anything and everything at all costs. That you would burn the ships. And say, God, I'm on here on purpose for your will, not my own. I want to pray over you. And if you would, just as a sign of reception, would you just, if you feel comfortable, open up your arms. <sighs> Jesus, we love you. But we're sorry for trying to do things on our own. We're sorry for limiting you, God. We're sorry for the things that we know that we shouldn't do, that we keep on doing. But God, today we ask that you would help us to step into a deeper relationship with you. God, that you would begin to speak to us in ways that we've never heard. I pray for a sensitivity to your voice. Lord, that we would hear the still, small, whisper voice as you lead us each and every day. God, I pray that we would be obedient to that voice. Sometimes it's easier to hear than to be obedient. So God, I pray for a supernatural strength to fall on every single person in this room. Lord, that as they hear you, that they would rise up with courage and with faith to step out into the things that you've called them to. Lord, to have supernatural courage, not to be afraid of what you've called them to, but to walk in faith knowing that you are the one that will plant the seed, that will make it flourish, and that you are the champion that will fight beside us. And God, I ask that you would begin to change our purpose, that we would see every single person as a son and daughter of yours. Lord, that we would see hurting people and realize that they need you and that you've placed us in their life. 
Lord, that you would help us to have wisdom and words of wisdom and words of knowledge, Lord, to speak into people's lives. Lord, to bring love, to bring kindness. Lord, to bring everything that you are, Lord, into the flesh for them. That we would walk out a true relationship with you and that people would see the way we love you and that it would change their perspective. That it would draw them in. That they would want to know you. Lord, we love you and we just ask that you would be with us as we go, that you would keep us safe. Lord, that you let your angels guard and protect around us. Lord, that you would bless us and keep us. Lord, and help us to not forget that we live for your will. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I believe that the Lord has spoken to your heart today. And I believe the Lord is going to use you this week to touch someone, to encourage someone, to help someone this week. Do you believe it? Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Spencer, for sharing your heart with us today. I'm going to ask our gentlemen if they will. Our usher is going to make their way to the back. We're going to continue to take our offering as we have. As we uh, dismiss today, please uh, follow the leading of the Lord. Let me tell you, there are those that think it bizarre and strange, some of the things that we do as Christians. But one thing in particular that seems strange to the world, because the world says if you want to have more, you got to hang on to more. But in the kingdom, to have more, you got to release. you got to let go. you got to give God first. And when you give God first, then he takes care of the rest. And so let me encourage you. Maybe you're in a situation right now and you've got need. Instead of approaching God with that need, why don't you approach God with that seed and begin to plant and watch the harvest begin to come back. So let me encourage you. In these days that we're living, one of the greatest things you can do in order to sustain and to help and to further your situation is to sow. Is to sow and to give the tithe where it rightfully belongs. A couple of announcements I want to give to you. September, we have dedicated as a month of prayer. And so we're actually going to start tomorrow morning. Uh, I know it's the last day of August, but we're going to get a jump start. From 9 to 2, this sanctuary will be open. It's coming.